this is Jen Orton of Two Red Pills. Um, as many of you may know, I am a despiser of corruption and an activist. Um, I am here co-interviewing Amon Jabi with my friend Robin Openshaw. Um, I've been aware of the global agenda since the late 1980s when I was in high school. And I like to say I knew the truth before it was actually called a conspiracy. A few months ago, I became aware of Amon Jabi's work when we spoke at the Red Pill Expo. The depth of information that he had was astounding, and I was particularly interested in his, his new information because I had a career in tech at Sony Electronics from the year 2000 in product marketing, and I was alarmed even 20-something years ago that all of the products that they were making were required by the government to have a camera. And I asked the lawyer one time, can, can that camera see us? Can it hear us? Can it record us? And when I was told yes, I, I was just beyond disappointed. So I called Robin, the green smoothie girl, to do this interview with me. I think it's one of the most crucial pieces of information we can share with you guys right now. And for those of you who don't know Robin, um, she ran 12 big protests in Utah. She's a health, wellness, longtime influencer. <laughs> She's a podcaster. She's a blogger. She's a 16-time author and all-around fighter for freedom. Basically, there's nothing Robin can't do. And she's been an ultimate warrior on the vaccine front. So thank you for, for joining us with this, Robin. Yeah, thanks for um, introducing me to Aman. I have heard his content and it is astonishing and he lays it end to end better than anybody I've ever seen. So you guys really wanna stay on till the end. At the end, Amon, we're definitely gonna task you with what would a community organizer do? What, what does someone who cares about the freedom of our children do to organize? So let's make sure at the end that we get to that. But I just want you guys to know that while this is a first for me to co-interview an amazing guest with Jen Orton, she's from Two Red Pills in Utah. And so she has, uh, she has led a lot of freedom activism in Utah, and she and I hang out, and we have a lot in common. We are both mothers of four children. We are both married to a man named John, and they are friends <laughs> now, and we both came out of tech. I was developing uh, software manuals. I was a managing editor of software manuals to Windows XP while she was over at Sony, and developing to Windows XP, so she's younger than I am, but, um, and we also are um, staunchly against the false appointment, not election, of one Spencer Cox, who calls himself the governor of Utah. He's the father of socialism in Utah. I will never, ever let Utah forget that. I ran from the socialist state of republic under Spencer Cox to Florida, where I've lived now for over two years, but Jen and I stay in very close contact and share information. And I, my heart is in Utah. My big family is in Utah. Jen is an incredible activist. She has four minor children. I don't know how she does everything she does. She too is an author. And she's just been absolutely tireless because this whole fight to retain our freedom and our souls, the spiritual war is, can be pretty exhausting. So I just, I just love and appreciate Jen. Um, want to introduce you to Aman Jabi. Thank you so much for giving us your time. We felt like we could use your time best if we could put you on all of our platforms at the same time. But um, Aman Jabi is an engineer who worked for 28 years in Silicon Valley, mostly in cameras. And he started to figure out what was going on. He has, at some point, headed to the hills in Montana. So Aman Jabi, thank you so much for being with us. I'm going to let you take it from here and just share with us, what was your background that alarmed you? How'd you end up in Montana and now just being so tireless in waking us all up to this AI state and this surveillance state. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I spent 28 years in Silicon Valley. My background is in electrical engineering and computer science, and I worked for Big Brother just like, uh, you know, you ladies did. Uh, I didn't know it at the time. I worked for some of the most uh, important companies uh, uh, in Silicon Valley, such as Sun Microsystems and Micron and others. And then I also co-founded two camera startup companies myself and raised a lot of money for the corporations. And along my journey, uh, I didn't really know when I was younger in my early twenties, you know, what's going on. But then as I grew older, something didn't, didn't seem right, but I kind of plowed along because you have to earn a living and, you know, move, continue. And once I got into the camera business, I started to, you know, uh, interact with uh, some of the largest uh, 
OEM companies doing cell phones. Uh, I was also a fund one of my first startups uh, was also had uh, funding from NQTEL, which is a venture capital arm of the CIA. So I started to see, you know, what kind of, uh, I, I shouldn't say agendas, but, you know, in the name of security and preventing terrorism, a lot of projects are going on all around the world. And so just slowly but surely, I started to kind of get awareness on how things might develop, even though I didn't really know of the agendas. Um, in 2014, I was invited by a large Fortune 50 company uh, to, uh, they wanted to fund a startup of mine where I was doing cameras for insights and they wanted to integrate it with smart cities. And that is when I first learned about what a smart city is. And it seemed really nefarious because it was about tracking everything and everyone all the time. And then my eyes started to open more and more. And then when COVID hit, I started to see actual infrastructure go up in San Francisco and all the dots connected immediately. I knew where they were going. They wanted to you know, have lockdown cities on the pretext of viruses initially and then for climate action. And I decided to leave San Francisco because I couldn't live there. Uh, it was totally contrary to my spirit. I ended up uh, finding Montana. I wanted to do some mountain flying. So Montana was one of the top two states to do some mountain flying outside of Alaska. I ended up here. Life is difficult here. It's really cold. Uh, it's not easy to live here, but uh, <laughs> I find it uh, much more uh, aligned to my spirit. So here I am. My daughter lives in Montana. She just moved up there last year to go to college. So I, I hear you. We, we spent a lot of time looking at the right place for her. And here in Utah, we have the smart cities there. We're seeing it here. I mean, all the, the buildings are here. The LED light poles are here. It, it's all in place. And I, I'm wondering, Amon, what percentage of the states could you even estimate already have this underway, the infrastructure? Huh? 100% and it's expanding. All, all the states have this infrastructure and it's expanding. When I came to Montana, I she, initially I was euphoric because I didn't really see anything in the you know smaller towns and villages around Northwest Montana, like absolutely no LED lights, no cameras. But within six months of arriving here, I started seeing the first pieces of equipment go up. And then in the first half of 2022, it's been going up at a really accelerated pace. And so I'm not happy. It's pretty clear that it's coming to the rural areas also. Mm. Yeah, at the beginning of this year, um, I, I mean, I left, uh, I left Utah because I left Park City for two reasons. One is a, a state run by Spencer Cox is not my home. Um, Florida's governor was looking pretty darn good at the time. Not that the governors get to make all the decisions. People think they're kings. They're not. Um, but the other thing is I didn't want to be in Park City, Utah, when the Rockefeller power grid started to go uh, doing blackouts four hours, four hours in Park City, unless you have backup power plans, um, could burst your pipes. And I saw what happened in Texas, and I was like, I, I want to get out of here. I want to go somewhere temperate. But the other thing is I, you know, I came here in Little Flagler Beach, mm -hmm which is, I think, the, the undiscovered cool little place in, in Florida. A friend of mine who's pretty awake to this whole agenda, too, at the beginning of this year said, Robin, you need to go out and drive around. You need to see all the cameras that are being installed on all of our stoplights. Tiny little town. It's exploding with growth because I'm not the only one who wants to run to Florida, right? But cameras going on everywhere. Will you just, you know, our audience doesn't know what you've presented on other platforms like Maria Z's, will you just start with what is happening? What do you see go going on and just lay it out for us? I think the key to understanding uh, what's coming is a complete digital system. And when I say digital, this is not about digitizing things. It is about literally going digital, which means one versus zero, which means you can versus you cannot. Digitalization is a relatively new term which has been introduced through the World Economic Forum papers and agendas. And digitalization means conditional access, which means that a new type of digital surveillance and a digital totalitarian system 
is going to be unrolled via the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals at a very high level. And I will explain all this in the coming minutes, where through digital control, there will be a digital currency assigned to everybody and it will be connected to your digital ID. And each person's digital ID will be used as a password to unlocking life, every aspect of life. So now that I've said that at a high level, it's fairly complicated, but think of it as we are going from, you know, sovereign human beings to debt slaves, which is the current system of fiat currency into a new type of slavery system called identity slavery and everything is related to your face, your identity through facial recognition cameras. So why are cameras being rolled out all around the world in order to collect data on you, your activities and identify you via your face? That is the reason why cameras are going up. They are not for traditional surveillance to catch the bad guys. They are not for safety or security and they are certainly not for sustainability. And there is a buzzword called sustainability which is being thrown around all over the world in the last few years. And it is all related to climate action. And the United Nations agenda for climate actions is called the Sustainable Development Goals. And that is what people are going to see across the board, whether you are in a corporation, whether you're in NGOs, whether you're in government. And uh, so this is really where the agenda is. Cameras are being put up everywhere. All cities, all intersections, every private retail store is going to have cameras, including facial recognition cameras and tracking cameras. And it is to basically build a data collection society because data is the new oil and carbon is going to be the new currency. Okay, so all this data that is being collected on everybody and everything is going to be processed by artificial intelligence in the cloud. And then all the relevant information is going to be logged on what is called a blockchain. If people have not heard of a blockchain, think of it as a digital ledger in the cloud. And once that data is in the blockchain, it is linked to your digital ID. And your digital ID combined with the blockchain data is essentially your digital leash, which is conditional access to life. And everything you do will be controlled by this digital currency, which is a currency of compliance and nothing more. Yeah, when I was um, speaking to the Sustainable Development Goals or SDG, I think people are becoming aware of those. And if you read the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, they read like something that we can all agree with because it has all these lovely words like sustainability and inclusivity and, you know, just like, you know, nobody left behind, all these things that everybody would agree with that on its face. Yeah. But it appears to me that they keep repositioning or rebranding the whole. Uh, climate change thing. When I was in high school and college, they were telling us that we were poking holes in the ozone layer with our with our cans of hairspray. Then it moved on to Al Gore saying that there's global warming and that we would all drown by 2020. And then with lots and lots of evidence that some places are actually cooling and that it's cyclical and maybe not all of that's true, then it became climate change. But similarly, it looks to me like SDG has been rebranded for the World Economic Forum to bring in, to be the bridge to all the corporations and bring in all the multinational mega billion dollar corporations to be part of it, to be the compliance state and to require it for, like you said, access to goods and services. And now it looks like they're calling it ESG and that's that is environmental, right. sustainable. No. No, it's environmental, social and governance. So ESG is the, going to be the new way where corporations are going to be judged and their stock uh, value is going to uh, be a function of how environmentally friendly they are supposedly by forcing their suppliers, customers, and employees uh, in a, to behave in a certain way, how socially responsible they are, as in how much money they spend on advertising for Black Lives Matter and LGBTQ and all that stuff. 
and uh, how they brand their products, showing Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ, and you know, social justice for prisoners and all that stuff. And governance is really corporate governance. What you know, governing bodies they have in place within the corporations to enforce this uh, environmental and social compliance across the board. So think of it as, uh, you know, having a communist regime in the guise of private corporations that are enforcing the agenda from the top. So you don't need prison guards to come and enforce the agenda. It's by virtue of corporations and their products, their employees and their suppliers and their customers. Aman, yeah, would you mind speaking toward um, the schools, actually, and how this has already infiltrated our education system? Yeah, uh, it's in the school stuff is a recent thing that I've been looking into, but how this is directly related to the agendas is, again, through cameras and the digital ID. Uh, they have uh, something called social and emotional learning, which they have introduced across the board in schools across the world. And uh, when I started to look at it, uh, I realized that this has nothing to do with social or emotional learning. It has everything to do with, you know, control of the child or of children. And it is to do with uh, manipulating the, their behavior. And this is being done through cameras and digital ID. So if you look, there are cameras everywhere in school. You know, when they have these, uh, you know, school shooting events, uh, there's the narrative of uh, gun rights versus gun control and the left versus the right and everyone is fighting with each other. But everybody agrees that the children need to be kept safe. And what do they do? They build the schools into concentration camps along with metal detectors and cameras everywhere. When COVID happened and they, uh, you know, locked down the schools, everybody, in, for instance, in San Francisco school district was given an iPad by virtue of Microsoft, uh, you know, free iPads for everyone. They all have cameras. All the education is done on those devices. And the AI is looking at the children's faces, doing eye tracking, facial recognition, emotional recognition. And you can use the feedback loop on what to display on the screen to manipulate a child's behavior. So that, there's that manipulation going on. I was just uh, reading yesterday about how Xi Jinping, who is now elected leader for life in communist China um, with a unanimous vote by the 450 people who don't want to die if they vote against him. Um, you know, that's pure communism. And of course, that's another thing they rebranded because they know that communism has a bad rap, even though it's rolled out in over 70 countries all over the, all over the world. But it looks to me like if we had to put a label on this thing, it would be like a blend of fascism and communism because the whole idea of a corporation, unless it's owned by the state, is actually antithetical to communism where the state owns the means of production. So it looks to me like the public-private partnership that the World Economic Forum is pushing, that's a nice word for this sort of fascist communist blend where only the few huge multi-billion dollar companies at the top are left standing. They're totally consolidating every single industry, buying up all the small businesses, driving the small businesses under. They've been doing this for, for decades. Um, joins together with government and government and these huge corporations are in lockstep and they're all intertwined. They're receiving money from each other, giving money to each other. They all have a plan together. And that's what changed from, from the sustainable development goals that really hadn't really moved much in like 15 years. And so they, the globalists figured out we need to bring the corporations in. And that's that's what seems to be different. But anyway, so Xi Jinping has apparently been opening these Confucius schools all over China because who doesn't love Confucius? Confucius was very wise. All we know about Confucius is he's like 2,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago or whatever it was. And he says all these, there's all these amazing quotes from him. So these schools, apparently the teachers are now starting to revolt because they're literally surveilling absolutely everything about the kids and the teachers and the curriculum and behavior and eye movements, like you said, and the, the people are starting to push back, which is very hard to do in communist China. But I just bring this up because I wonder if you know anything about that or want to jump off from there, because you know what they say is what you see China doing is where we'll be in five years. 
Oh, we are already here. People just don't know it. Uh, but uh, there's one other point I want to make before I address some of the things you just said is they've also, uh, you know, one of the things is children are big business and all human beings are big business. One of the agendas for this new type of system that's going to be unrolled is going to be making money of people and children in real time. So every time your face is in front of a, co a camera, uh, money is being made in real time by investors in Wall Street and beyond. So how do they do it with kids? They are tracking kids through the cameras in their schools, on their devices, at home, as well as in their schools, in their parking lots, in their sports stadiums, wherever they are. And what they have securitized the betting for kids where they say, from cradle to career, we are going to, in real time, allow securitization where we can bet on a group of children on where they are going to be. So many are going to become doctors, so many are going to become lawyers, so many, so many are going to go into the environmental field. And then they can keep betting and in real time and see what, what outcomes they are. So it's outcome-based betting. And they can manipulate that outcome through the cameras and through manipulation, as I spoke about. If the for the broken kids that have more issues or come from broken families, they can make even more money through intervention because now you're going to have more degrees of manipulation and betting. So the whole idea of having cameras and data collection in schools is about manipulating the social and emotional learning where you control and manage the kids' behavior as well as you make money on betting. That is what this whole system is all about. So my take is that if you have kids or grandkids, you should be seriously reconsidering whether you want to send them to these communist schools. Because if you send your kids to communist schools, don't expect communists not to come home in the evenings. Well, and it's yeah. very interesting here because they've shifted. I used to be on a school board a, f a few years back for four years, and I vehemently fought against, you know, Common Core and these other things, including the state testing. And the state testing across the nation now has moved from a standards per uh, performance based criteria to a behavioral. In other words, you're deemed successful, not if you can solve physics or math problems correctly, but if you answer the questions appropriately in a behavioral manner. In other words, if your beliefs are in line with what they want you to believe, if you're, you know, believing and doing and complying, that's where your scores really come from. And, and if parents are out there and if they're, if they're still willing to put their kids in public schools, opt out of those tests as much as you can. Those are directly tied to their social credit score. Even, even in Utah, we have this in our schools right now, the ESG credit scores for these kids. It's horrific. And I, I want to say uh, Jen's kids are 18 and younger, mine are 22 and older, that I don't think that parents of minors understand how much influence you lose when they go off to college. Um, I paid for some college degrees of kids who came out of college, uh, leftist communists. And I was a co-founder of Utah's first charter school. I helped pick the curriculum. It was a conservative, um, academically rigorous curriculum. Then I was a co-founder of a charter high school. In, in Utah, and I'm just here to say for anybody who can still get their kids out, because it's really hard to do in junior high and high school, because all they care about is I want to go to where my friends are. Nobody wants to pull a teenager out of school and have an angry teenager at home that they're trying to educate. But I want to say this, and I hope that some parents of minors are listening. If I took my children out of school and I was a single working mom, which I was for 12 years, I would get them a stack of library books and direct their education and have them write five paragraph essays on each book they read rather than putting them in the commie conditioning camps. Right. Any comments but about the, that, Amon? The, the litmus test, uh, no, that's both of you are right. The litmus test to see whether you are uh, sending your kids to a communist school is, are there LED lights in the parking lots and inside the hallways? Are there cameras inside the hallways and any cameras outside? And is there a microwave tower somewhere in the vicinity of a stadium? And okay. if there okay, is an answer, go... sorry? 
I was just going to say, what's going on with the lights? Like, I hear that the CFG light bulbs are going to be illegal as of this summer. And like my house, I'm a prepper. And my house, which I bought as it was, it has these lights that I can't unscrew. I can't figure out how to get a replacement one. What is up with the LED lights? Are they surveilling us in every LED light? No, LED lights serve many functions. One is they they weaken your eyesight for sure, especially in the if you're in the 474 80 nanometer spectrum. And most of these lights that we have at home or in our automobiles and stuff, they're all uh, you know, blue LED, even though you might put a white filter on it to make it look white, they're all blue LED lights and they are designed to uh, weaken your eyesight, cause macular degeneration, uh, retinal damage, etc. So imagine a population with weak eyesight, eyesight. Are you capable of resisting? Mm. Are you capable of resisting? Number two, uh, LED lights, they, uh, they have a, a, you know, they often have uh, the lighting which allows cameras to see really well at night. And they are basically wherever the LED lights are going to be in smart cities or inside schools and offices, there are going to be cameras. Your, your uh, you know, halogen lights and uh, incandescent lights, they don't do a good job for capturing faces and uh, identifying people. So that's, that's Come on. Yet a, do you Sorry, go ahead. Do you have a picture you can put up there for people so that they, they're they aware of it, at least, even if it's a street light, that they can start to recognize these things? I can. Hold on. Yeah. And while you're doing that, I just wanted to mention, I have contracts here in Utah, and I'm sure it's across the United States, where schools are being paid to put these 5G towers up on their properties. Yeah, okay, we just thought give me 30 seconds. It comes up, I'll stop, but we, we thought the 5G fight in Park City, Utah, and they were at the schools. They would get something like Smith's Grocery Stores. There was 11 of them uh, at the Smith's Grocery Store. All right. Okay, I put it on full screen. So, so uh, when people are driving on highways and freeways in many parts, especially near metropolitan areas, you see freeways that look like this. They're filled with LED lights and uh, people need to ask the question why. And you should also be aware that when you try to look up at these LED lights, they are extremely blinding and they are going to hurt your eyes. So they are also designed for people to look down. They are designed to not look up at the sky. They are designed for human beings to have a slavery kind of status, right? Free people with courage and other you know, good properties of a human being, they look up. These lights are designed to look down. And so these are known as smart lights and smart, uh, which are put on smart poles. And this is an example of a smart corridor which connects cities and zones. Um, typically uh, in cities, what they're gonna do is have uh, some of the lights uh, with facial recognition cameras, microphones, loudspeakers to give instructions to you know, citizens, which are going to be slaves, uh, just like in Auschwitz camps in Nazi Germany. And they're gonna have LED screens for instructions. Many of these lights specifications, I've seen some of them, they have drone charging stations on top of these flat LED lights on top, uh, because uh, in the future, the goal is to have uh, aerial drones as the new police essentially. And uh, so people need to be very uh, aware what these LED lights can be about. And there are further diabolical agendas at play here. Um, here is a little uh, you know, clip of Pablo Montana, an hour from south of me with a population of 2000. And when I came here two and a half years ago, there were no lights here on this freeway. And now they have hundreds of these lights that have gone up and it's in the name of uh, climate action and to for energy efficiency. So we went from zero lights to a few hundred lights in this part of Pablo Montana in the name of energy efficiency. So the question to ask is why? Does it, does it actually consume less energy? Do they not, do these bulbs, I don't know how to even stock an extra bulb for when it burns out. Do they not burn out or something? It, it, that, so that's my question is like, there is what a, exactly? There is, there is, 
I have never actually done an experiment myself, but it is uh, the household bulbs they say is 30 to 50% more energy efficient. Uh, and given the fact that climate action is all it's, uh, that is being used as a pretext to you know, usher in these agendas, uh, there is a huge transition to LED bulbs and uh, it's not recommended because they're really bad for your eyes, whether you're at home or you're outside. Well, that makes perfect sense. You're making a pun intended light bulb go on for me because I have had 2020 vision. I don't wear glasses. What you see me here with are blue light glasses. There's no prescription. I left Utah where I had regular light bulbs intentionally came here and these are already in the house that I bought and my eyes my eyes are tired all the time like I worked full time on a screen then and now and you know it's easy to just go well aging but it's only been a no. little over two years but yeah. I wear these all the time now yeah no nope. my mom's 82 and her eyes are perfect so there's also this project uh, that the DHS had funded more than 15 years ago called the LED incapacitator and it was on the pretext of taking down terrorists uh, in the vicinity of, uh, you know, these lights or, uh, you know, police, policemen carrying these little puke rays, as they are called. And these have, you know, multicolored LEDs inside a circular configuration. On the right is a, a picture somebody sent me from one of the cities in Canada on the West Coast, I think from Vancouver. And you can project multiple colors at a very high frequency uh, and high intensity and it causes intracranial pressure in a human being or an animal and it can make you nauseous it can cause spinal damage and potentially even death uh, if the intensity is uh, you know high enough so there are a lot of diabolical things that led lights can do it's not a good frequency it's not a frequency of uh, you know uh, that is uh, a synchronous to human life. So, Aman, am I getting this right? They are using LED. They're basically weaponizing. L that, is using my, LED that, that, is, that is my conclusion. LEDs are required too. for, the, uh, firstly, again, as I said, they are meant to um, mess up your eyesight. They're meant for human beings to look down, which is basically a slave status. Uh, they can be used as weapons further, potentially, depending on, you know, what those particular lights are. And they are meant to track you, basically, through cameras. You need that light in order to track data everywhere. And mm. where the LED lights will not be in the future, those are the areas they plan to have humans moved away from. Because the goal is longer term, everybody moves into smart cities and then lock them down in smart cities. So okay. if you don't have LED lights uh, in your area, you you should that should be a signal to you that that area is going to be no man's land downstream. No man's land downstream. Yep. Tell as in a few years from now, as in a few years from now, I mean they've already got the wildlands project map for the United States published many years ago. So if you haven't seen it. I would recommend people do a Google image search to see the wildlands uh, uh, map of the United States. And that'll tell you exactly what the goals are, where the smart cities and zones are going to be. So I think you're saying that there's like zones where they're not doing this because they figure it'll be people like us who are like, I'm not doing that. I'm not participating. I'm not going to get your 16 injections to be able to mm -hmm. live in the smart city and you, the government the private public private partnership provides me everything and i'm just kind of this clock puncher don't have to work very hard so some of us will go out to these no man's lens what i think you're talking about right that is right but they're not going to uh, sit, uh, rest easy un uh, until they've driven those people into the smart cities it's not sure. that life is going to be easy and uh, we're going to be left alone no for sure okay so i read this novel it was published 14 years ago just read it last year a friend insisted that i read it it's like the kind of stuff i would never normally read but it's like a dystopian sci-fi novel called ready player one and okay. it was later made into a movie but 14 years ago you guys can read it if you want it they literally predicted all of this and 
So can you talk more about the smart cities where, you know, in, in this dystopian novel, they were just stacking, they called them the stacks and poor people would live in like fifth wheels, all just stacked up and kind of in a cage and you kind of had to go down by ladders, but they were just driving everyone into the cities so that they could control them better. And tell us more about smart cities. Right. So one of the one of the concepts that I would like to introduce to your audience is the concept of geofencing. So geofencing literally means building a, a sort of a an invisible fence around you or an object beyond which you cannot go. And at the heart of implementing geofencing will be your digital identity via facial recognition. And that is basically access control, you know. So how where you can fly and how far you can fly, that can be controlled. How far you can drive can be controlled. Where you can drive can be controlled. Where can you walk? You can be geofenced there too. And in about two, three weeks ago, the uh, in Oxford in UK, they uh, are actually starting to talk about implementing the 15 minute cities. So they've broken down Oxford into six districts and anybody in a given district is only allowed to drive out of their district twice a week. So they've limited uh, driving 100 times a year outside your district. And each time you want to leave your district, you have to get permission. So you have to get a permit. And if you drive without a permit or exceed your twice a week, you're given an 80 pound fine. So they are thinking of implementing this and they will. It's the Hunger Games Society. That's so Yeah, Hunger there Games. you go. Right. And then what? how else can they geofence you through smart contracts and your central banking digital currency? What are smart contracts mean? They can have your digital currency will have your carbon credits, your reputation capital, which is similar to the social credit system in China. And it'll have your, uh, you know, uh, COVID vaccination status and booster status and all that. So if you have not been compliant, your smart contracts, uh, your CBDC won't work, or they can decide that your currency will only work within five miles of your house or within 10 miles of your house. So that is another way they'll geofence people, right? You can also be geofenced in the electronic world or the metaverse. Who can you communicate with? Who can you send an email to? What music you can listen to? Who can you text? When can you text? And so on and so forth. So the instruments for compliance and control are endless once you get a digital identity and the whole system is moved into this identity slavery system. And for smart cities, they are selling smart cities in the name of sustainable development, right? For energy efficiency, optimizing movement of traffic, movement of goods and services. And related to that is the zero carbon agenda. They, their goal is to have a net zero effect by 2050. And so they want to have better air quality. They want to have better smart lighting, water management, noise pollution, traffic monitoring, and so on and so forth. But in reality, it's about limiting mobility and ultimately no car ownership at all. They want to have a surveillance and control grid via LED lights. Water management is about water rationing. Uh, like in places like Montana, they're trying to limit the water rights on your own property and your wells. They've given the water rights to the Indian tribes and uh, Sure enough, in the near future, they probably want smart meters on everybody's well, water meters. So noise pollution is really putting sensors and microphones for speech surveillance, mobility traffic tracking, and then rationing of energy. So all these United Nations and World Economic Forum, their goals and their agendas use really, really nice words for the planet. They use really cute phrases to sell the agenda, but it's all inverted language. It's, there's an inversion in the language that everyone should be looking out for. So for instance, they say no hunger or zero hunger. What does that mean? It means in reality, there will be no more farming. There will be no more uh, you know, uh, beef. There'll be no more uh, pork, et cetera. They're gonna have synthetic foods. Zero poverty or no poverty means everyone's going to be basically 
you know, brought down from the current Western standard living and so on and so forth. So it's really important to understand their, uh, the inversion in language. This is the United Nations Charter. Uh, there are 17 sustainable development goals and one can go to their United Nations website and see all the details. And at the heart of this is again, your digital ID and the net zero 2050 agenda they are move, going to move away from you know, hydroelectric and coal and other natural ways of generating electricity and moving, they're trying to move to um, using wind and, uh, you know, and other means of electricity, solar. And solar and wind is never going to manage to achieve the supply demand for human beings. So as a result of which expect extreme drop in energy supply to human beings and to to places outside of the cities. And even within the cities, uh, energy is going to be rationed significantly, right? So digital ID is at the heart of it. Cameras are an, uh, is one of the answers for sustainable development goals and SDG 13. And you're gonna be watched and tracked all the time. Thank you to the United Nations Charter. And so, SDGs is all about data harvesting and they use fake legal instruments to manipulate both life, life of humans, animals, as well as natural resources. Even every tree is going to have a digital ID, every crop's gonna have a digital ID. And the people with you know hundreds of thousands of acres uh, with lots of trees, they are gonna basically be digitally rich in the new uh, you know, Wall Street world because it's going to be related to carbon. So remember, carbon is the new currency and data is the new oil. So people who own a big tract of land with a lot of trees are rich in the Wall Street world? Uh, initially, yes. So let's say you own 10 acres, okay? And I am, let's say I am worth hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in Wall Street and I have money in a hedge fund. Uh, I can go and uh, put bets on the trees on your house and each of your trees is going to have a digital ID and I can, you know, go and contribute money to your property in the digital worlds. This is called natural asset classes. And I slowly but surely start to own your land. This is one of the ways that you will own nothing and be happy by 2030. And if you and your property don't allow the inspectors to come in and count the trees and look at the tree health of everything, you're, you will be taxed heavily because in the name of sustainable development, you have to give up that right. And if you give up that right, then you will get a, you know, a trickle down money because Wall Street is betting on your trees and your natural assets on your property. So it's well, a really con a convoluted way of uh, taking people's property rights. There's a there's a bunch of different mechanisms in the economy by which they're driving property owners under, for instance, like the rental shortage, you know, putting all these restrictions on landlords. There's talk of, of rent controls, he, even here in Florida, but, it'll, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's happened. It's already happening in New York, et cetera. So somebody who is a landlord, your mortgage payment on that rental property might be as high as the rent you get. But now you know, if you bought it in 20 or 2021, real estate prices are coming down and governments are getting really aggressive in Canada and the US about that you have to, you can't discriminate against any tenant. So you've got a one bedroom apartment, you might have to take a single mom with four kids. Um, there's also the fact that as these property values have gone way up, like my property taxes here in Florida more than tripled, more than tripled. And it's not new for government as as land value increases or as property value increases that your taxes get so high that you know little old ladies have been foreclosed on on their little farmhouse on a bunch of acres for decades for decades this has happened because their property taxes get to the point that they can't pay it but they own this land and they literally lose it to the government so this is just the natural progression of what, yeah, what we've are, seen that, and that if, is another way that is another way and then I believe that by uh, every house has to have eventually a zero carbon footprint. So 
let's say you even if you are reasonably well off and you own your house you will end up having to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to upgrade your house for a zero carbon footprint and if you can't then they'll take away your house in the name of climate change and global warming and sustainability that's another way they're going to do it and then the other is the obvious one is that you don't actually even own your house if you paid it off because as a united states citizen you cannot actually have full ownership of anything uh, as uh, as a 14th amendment citizen you are property of the federal corporation and property cannot own property and that needs to be understood by us citizens so you actually don't own your vehicle you don't own your house you don't own your television it's all owned by the corporation yeah and even if you think you do and it feels good to not make a mortgage payment my house is paid off on my i've never had a car loan even if you think you do there's the fact that my property taxes just tripled and my property taxes are now what a house payment was 10 years ago and then there's the insurance that just keeps going up you know we just got clobbered with two hurricanes in a row and you know we had to make a claim on flood insurance which we were blessed that mm -hmm. we even had flood insurance but then then of course you know your deductibles go up i mean i was paying like forty five hundred dollars a year for flood insurance so they they'll they get you one way or another we we still i still think it's a good idea i just want to say this like i still think it's a good idea for you guys to do you know one of your first priorities when you're preparing is get out of debt especially consumer debt because it's just crushing so that's so right. Aman. Um, yes. question for you. It seems like we're kind of moving toward the, you know, things people can do. Um, when, when they're tracking these cameras, for example, on children's Chromebooks at school or in, in public, is there any protection? Um, you know, is there something you can put over the camera or on your face, anything like that to help minimize the tracking and surveillance? Or opt your kids out? Well, uh, on your device, the, on the devices, uh, both kids and adults should have their cameras blocked all the time. But that's not a that's not a good long term solution. That's an individual. Uh, that's an individual step that can and should be taken. But in schools, it's not just the cameras on your device. It's the cameras in the classrooms and the hallways and the parking lots and the gymnasium and everywhere else. So, as I said, if there are cameras in your school, that's a litmus test that you're sending your school to a communist concentration camp where they are going to be programmed and brainwashed before they come home every evening. So if that's the kind of children you want to uh, have grown up, then keep sending to the, them to those schools. Otherwise, rethink. Yeah. And they condition you actually, they condition these kids against their mm -hmm. own parents too. I mean, exactly. they, they're, they're teaching them, your parents are the ones who screwed this world up, world up, whatever right. it is you don't like about the world. It's your parents and your grandparents fault. You should cancel them. I'm not saying it's that overt. It, it is, it may not be as overt, but it's the effect is actually as effective, you know? Uh, because I've, I mean, I've seen my, you know, nieces and stuff over the years growing up in the Bay Area, they were born here, how they have been able to change uh, the thinking of their parents. Uh, and, and so my generation in the San Francisco Bay Area, in New York, friends, family, Chicago, everywhere in the world, actually, they've, they are now all aligned with what the kids have been taught. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting here in Utah, many of our public schools actually teach Chinese in the public schools as an, as an immersion language. And I can't help but think that's because we had a governor who left office to be the ambassador to China under Obama. And we were host here in Salt Lake City in 2019 to the United Nations Conference, the first city besides New York in the America to ever have the quote unquote, privilege of doing so. And I think the infiltration is just so deep. Yeah, but it, as far as China is concerned, it's, it's just an artificial boundary around, you know, a certain piece of land. The enemy, China is as deep down or maybe further deep down than we are in, in, in being taken over and have been turned into a complete communist regime for so long. What is happening is this is being done through, you know, deeper and darker forces. And they're now coming for the rest of the countries. 
So China is not your enemy, even right. though and, that's and the I wanna, narrative. <laughs> I want to kind of point out for people and, and move this into every single thing you can think of, Amon. You could give us the lightning round or whatever, like every single thing we can do to take action. Because I find that when we talk about these things, that it's really easy for people to get totally demoralized. And I want to say a few things about that. First of all, I know a lot about Chinese history from at least like the last hundred years or so. And under Chairman Mao was some of the worst tyranny in history. And then there were a couple of leaders in China who actually opened up to more capitalism and the people had more freedom. And now Xi Jinping is trying to take them back to total, a total grind. And we're seeing all kinds of problems. But, with, it, but with, it's not him. But It's not him. It's the powers behind him. Right. It's just like, it's not him. This is... This is a Fabian agenda. It's like different from Leninism and communism. This is Fabianism, the way they have infiltrated all levels of government in all the countries slowly without people knowing what's happened. What I, what I want to avoid here is people just saying it's hopeless. Um, it's I guess not I'll hopeless. just get my, I'll get my <laughs> affairs in order. And I just want to say there's billions of us and few of them, and the Chinese people have pushed back. They have a saying there that roughly equates in English to the hills are wide and the government is far away. And people have, you know, throughout 5,000 years of Chinese history taken their, taken their country back. These people are not as strong as we think. These are, what I want to say is these are their plans. Okay, don't lay down for this and think there's nothing I can do. Let's go through what we can do and what we do need to do well on an individual and family level but also if you have ideas about like what are you doing in montana that you think can work for people who are listening or who are actual action takers and amon i know i know you shared with me you had five ideas you weren't sure were ready to be um, yeah. shared yet publicly our audiences would appreciate and understand those but if you're not well uh, ready to to share those publicly that's fine too yeah, I, I think uh, there's a lot of learning to be done before one can even digest those five ideas, but there is a way okay. out. Uh, my first step is essentially education. Everyone needs to be educated on what is being done. And I suspect your audience already understands that. Why is it being done? And then I think most importantly, is how did it come to be in America? So you have to go back to all your history right from the founding uh, you know, uh, days and from the 1700s and understand what were all the key inflection points and milestones in American history, which has allowed us to be in today's position. And until people understand that, they won't be able to appreciate the other steps. Mm -hmm. Right? How many uh, U.S. citizens understand that they are have a slave status and the Constitution, the rights that they think that the Constitution protects them from, doesn't exist? Not uh, you. you uh, there is not a single piece in the Constitution that protects a United States citizen. How many people in the audience understand that? And until they do, it's going to be hard for me to discuss these other steps understood yeah I, I think in 1776 i used to teach the constitution there's actually lots of protections for u.s citizens and in the bill of rights as well lots and lots of rights for the citizen okay, okay. let's talk but, about that but then, let's talk about that <laughs> but, let's but talk then about the corporation that. came later before the corporation even right the 1861 the civil war ended and the whole world is taught, especially the kids growing up in, in America, and I didn't grow up here, and I'm just learning. I'm in the process of learning. I'm you know, learning from some big time historians uh, around the country. But it was important for me to start digging deep in order to find solutions. And I realized that until I understand how it came to be, there is no solution. But once you understand, then you can start to find solutions. So. 1861, civil war ended. The world was told that the civil war was fought to free the black slaves. That's not the case. It was to introduce the 13th and 
14th Amendments. And 13th Amendment said involuntary servitude is illegal. They didn't say 40, uh, that voluntary servitude is illegal. And the 14th Amendment introduced a new class of citizens called the United States citizen. So they gave immunities and protections to the United States citizens by virtue of the 14th Amendment, right? And so the black slaves came under this category, which is the US citizen. And then in the early 1900s, through deceit and uh, you know the treachery of using deceitful language, they pulled in the rest of Americans, which were nationals, into becoming US citizens. And 14th Amendment, US citizen is property of the federal corporation. As property, you cannot own property. As property, you have slave status, which means you, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights do not apply to you. And what do you especially think about not the, after the World Powers Act, especially what do you after think the, about the war. Sorry? What do you think about the state national movement? Do you think that there's any legitimacy to it? People detaching from the Borg? I, I believe there is, uh, but you, one has to study all these things and understand uh, you know, uh, how this treachery came to be. And in fact, my second step is now that you brought it up is re reject your slavery status, which means exactly what you just said. And if you understood that, then number three is to undo the smart cities infrastructure. And number four is reject fiat currencies. And number five is build a local society based on voluntary cooperation. And once yeah. you impl implement these five steps, you can live in a virtuous world. You can be virtuous yourself because in order to be virtuous, you need free space and you need to be in a free society. But that I requires agree. courage. I agree with all of that. And I agree that we need to constantly remind ourselves to have courage. You know, we have to realize that we have lived through the golden age and our, we and our parents and our grandparents have had very little adversity in the last 50 years. Life has been as good as it's probably ever been in the history of the world. Most of the history of the world is people freezing and starving to death, not to be dark, but it's just a fact. So you know, here we are, we have to, what, what are you going to just lay down for it? Of course not. The people of courage, the people with moral character, people of integrity will do everything in their power to push back on this. And I see lots of people just saying, you know, when I ran those 12 big protests in Utah in 2020, I was a vaccine injured person in grad school. I got a flu vaccine that put me in bed for four years, but that's not even what I was running the protests about. The vaccine hadn't even arrived. I was already moved to Florida by the time the vaccine arrived could see it coming, but my protests were against the destruction of the free market system. We're uh, against we didn't, the destruction. We never, had a free, we never had a free market system. We had a debt slavery system since the Federal Reserve was uh, enacted. Yeah, and and my audience, and I think Jen's too, we've, we've gone through a ton of this stuff and people who follow me on Telegram or Facebook, I'm constantly sharing whole huge documentary series about these. So absolutely right, but um, you do, you, you were given your rights by God, everyone listening, you're given your rights by God. We do have to stop acting like slaves. We have to stop acquiescing. We have to say, no, it's, th this is, this is a moment in history that is a massive opportunity. And I kind of want to close on this and have you back when you're ready to flesh out your, your five points and go deeper on that is that we have to find our resilience and our resourcefulness that we lost after decades of so much affluence that we're just not very gritty anymore. Um, but we have to, we, we, we have a moment here in time where we can take advantage of this. Um, you know, I was organizing people from March 1st, 2020 on, and I kind of feel like things have to fall apart more before people actually take action. Cause it's pretty tough to get people to take action throughout 2020. The big thing they would tell me is, oh, sorry, I can't come to your protest because I have soccer practice. And I would have told Jen this, that people are basically, I, I felt like saying, it's soccer practice itself that's in jeopardy here, but we we have to we we have this moment in time where the lowest trust in government in history is in the polls, the lowest trust in media in history. So we have a lot of critical mass, we have a lot of momentum, 
we just have to be willing to not try to hope that somebody else is going to stand up and speak up about it. It just has to be more of us. And we have to say no to things. And we have we have more power than we think. And when when I see the public pushing back, they pull back on their agenda. Now, do they rebrand it? Come through another door in six months or a year? Yes. Think contact tracing in 2020, everyone. <laughs> so, but I just, I totally agree with that. Do you have any final thoughts for us, Amon? Yeah, I, there are two points that came to my mind is, uh, there are two things I want to say. One is, at a fed, we can't win this battle now at a federal or a state level in the near future. Where we can fight is at a local level. So this is, it's local action that needs to be taken and people need to find like-minded people in their local neighborhoods and communities, raise awareness and then come up with local action plans. And at a more of a macro statement I'd like to make is that we don't have any representative government left in the United States at any level. All the politicians, bureaucrats, everybody, they work for the private corporation called the United States. It's a private corporation. And until people figure that out, they'll be fighting the wrong enemy on the wrong battlefield with the wrong weapons. Yeah, I, I do want to say, you know, I've said this since 2020 that me going, getting into politics and going and fighting at the legislature, I've done some of it, but it's not where I put my time. Um, fighting the school districts to me feels like a totally lost cause. Pull your kids out. But I do want to say that I do appreciate the people who fight those battles because as we push back, even if we're buying our children more time and we're finding time and space for them to pull back, for us to find ways forward, I couldn't be more impressed 99% of the time with my governor here in Florida. I don't think they've subverted him. He's going out there and saying they're going to they're, he's going to hold the mRNA companies pause, accountable. Pause, pause, pause. Is he letting the smart city infrastructure go up in every city and town in Florida? Yeah, so yes. I don't, uh, he's not He a is king. part of the problem. He is part of the system. So I don't want this to go he's sideways. He's an actor. <laughs> I don't want this to go sideways into there's nothing you can do, hopelessness. No, I because... never said you cannot do anything, right. but at the, the, your, but... your governor is an actor in the whole scheme of things. Maybe. All he's doing is Maybe. taking the conversation away from the smart cities because that is the only action we can take to fight this beast system that's being unrolled upon the world. Yeah, you have be, to but undo I, the I have smart city infrastructure. I have more hope than that. I, appre I totally appreciate everything you're saying. And when you have your five things and you want to come flush it out with us, I would love that. You guys, there is there are things you can do. You do have rights. You're given rights by the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, but it comes before that. That's just the document that was drafted. He's right about the corporation, all of that. He's right about private property ownership, but we actually have to be part of the resistance. And so with that, I appreciate you both so much. Thanks for bringing um, Mr. Jobby to us, Jen, and we will see you guys next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.